It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hey, everyone. A few days ago, Lucas and I chatted with paleontologist Dr. Steve Salisbury from the University of Queensland. Uh, It was a great chat. We were talking about his recent discoveries of dinosaur footprints in Australia, as well as some dinosaur skeletons uh, he discovered in Antarctica. Uh, And when we called Steve on Skype, he was just putting his kids in the bath. So you will hear them in the background a little bit. Um, And Skype was playing up a bit and it was sort of choppy and distorted, but we've cleaned it up as best we can. Uh, It's still a really fascinating discussion, so I really hope you like it. Here it is. Hello and welcome to another Science on Top special episode. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Lucas Randall. Hello, Ed. And we're joined by paleontologist at the University of Queensland and research associate at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, Dr. Steve Salisbury. Welcome to the show. Good evening. You are a fossil hunter, a dinosaur discoverer. Is that right? <laughs> that is, yeah. I'm a, I'm a paleontologist, but I, I specialise in dinosaurs and fossil crocodiles. I think you have one of the best jobs in the world because not only do you deal with dinosaurs and, and researching dinosaur footprints and stuff, you also get to spend a lot of time in Broome and the Kimberley region, which is a beautiful place and one of my favourite holiday spots. Uh, you're a lucky man. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I love the, the places we get to go to, although at the moment I feel like I need somewhere temperate just to kind of balance things because I'm either in Broome sweating it out in the sun um, or freezing myself in um, Antarctica. So, yeah, somewhere maybe around Sydney or Victoria, that would be good. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say come visit in, 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 uh, us in Melbourne and uh, we're sort of semi-temperate. Uh, we have moments yeah. where we're, you know, verging on the uh, Antarctic climate. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's not too bad at the moment. I think we've got a few dinosaur fossil sites around as well in the sort of Gippsland region, I think. But, but nothing quite as impressive as what you've just found in, uh, well, not just found, over the last few years, I guess, you've been studying these and finding them. Uh, you found some giant footprints and tracks in the Kimberley region in Australia's northwest uh, coast. Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, so for the last six years, we've I've, I've lost track how many times we've been up there. Um, spent a lot of time up in Broome and in the Kimberley in the Dampier Peninsula um, looking at dinosaur tracks that occur along the coast in rocks of the broom sandstone that are only visible in the intertidal zone, which makes for fairly challenging but also enjoyable field work, some pretty spectacular beaches up there. Um, And there are literally thousands of dinosaur tracks scattered over about 100 kilometres of coastline there. And we've just published a, a sort of major monograph um, on the tracks in the area around Womerdon or James Price Point, about 25 kilometres of that coastline. And it took us a while to sort it out. Obviously, six years is a long time to be doing something like this, but we literally had to sort through and, you know, first find and then document and then make sense of you know, thousands of dinosaur tracks. And we worked out in the end and after a long peer review process um, that there are at least 21 different types of dinosaur tracks up there and that makes it the most diverse dinosaur track fauna anywhere in the world. And, I mean, that that in itself is a pretty amazing thing to have in Australia. But Amongst the tracks, there's also some some really spectacular finds. And, and, you know, a lot of people have been interested in some of the really giant, probably the biggest <coughs> ever dinosaur tracks recorded that we found up there. So a number of the sauropod tracks are in excess of 1.7 metres. 
So they are enormous. And we had some photos of those that um, <laughs> everyone just kind of can't get enough of, which yeah, is understandable because they are just incredible. And the sauropod ones, so, so they're sort of round like an elephant kind of footprint, aren't they? So are you talking 1.7 metres in diameter, I guess, is it? Um, no, they're, they're not. I mean, sort sometimes they end up being sort of round, but um, one of the things we had to sort of come to terms with up there and we just sort of, you know, the more time we spend on the rocks, looking at the rocks and trying to track these dinosaurs, sort of we worked out that a lot of them have got really strange shaped feet. Um, you know, <laughs> some of them are round, some of them are quite oblong shaped some of them have got really elongate heels some have got big toes some of them look like they could stretch their toes out and then bring them back in again um very very um diverse sort of morphology just just amongst the sauropods not counting all the other ones so there were six different types of sauropod tracks that we recognized and the the biggest ones belong to um a morphotype, like a, a sort of type of track we didn't name, but there was sort of enough of them to kind of put them in a group. And they're, they're kind of triangular in their outline. So they've got like a sort of a heel at one end and then it flares out to some big toes. So the, the 1.7 is the length of those tracks. So they've, they've got quite a big heel, those guys. And based on the, sh- the shape and size of those tracks and also the spacing so we can sort of work out from the spacing of the tracks um, roughly what the length of the torso of the the animal that made them was and also using the um, sort of body proportions of, of other sauropods we've been able to work out that those giant tracks would have been made by an animal that conservatively would have been about five and a half metres high at the hips. Wow. That's huge. <laughs> it's huge. Yeah. So you're talking about a, a footprint the size of a decent bathtub, um, probably a bit wider. So most people will be able to lie in, in it. Um, and then a leg that's, you know, the height of, big enough for the animal to step over a bus. Step over a bus. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Kind of ridiculous. And, you know, at first we didn't even – spot these because they were just so big we're sort of walking past them in a couple of spots for a while because they're kind of beyond our search image Um, but you kind of need to time when you track the dinosaurs up there obviously with the tides Mm. and also with the light if you do it in a direct in direct sunlight where you don't get a lot of shadow it's hard to see the tracks and if you do it in in low light Ideally, in the, the late afternoon, the, the rock really comes alive and you can see the tracks much more easily. And it's, it's when you do that and also get above the surfaces that the tracks are on because in a lot of areas there's just so many of them, it's hard to kind of get your head around what's going on. But we ended up <coughs> using um, drones and also light aircraft to, to photograph and laser scan the tracks from the air. And when we did that, that allowed us to see a lot of patterns that weren't obvious from the ground. And it was through doing that and also just getting our eye in for the different shapes that we realised some of these, you know, what we had originally thought were just, you know, rock pools and potholes yeah. um, were actually tracks. Steve, a question, if I may, just, just following on from, from that last point that you made, that originally you thought they were, you know, it was assumed that they were just rock pools and so forth, um, and some of the imaging techniques that we use, I'm, I'm very interested in that. I, I'm really surprised to hear um, that, um, that this area wasn't, uh, like, was this area targeted specifically because of uh, other fossilised footprints that have found in the past, or what, why were you even looking there? Um, well, it, it had been known that there are tracks in this area, probably you know, amongst paleontologists since the sort of 1990s or thereabouts, but for the um, Indigenous people of the Dampier Peninsula, tracks have been known for thousands of years. Um, so it's, it's not really news in that sense. But the reason we were there um, was because Womerden or James Price Point had been selected by the West Australian government as the site for a $45 billion liquid natural gas processing precinct and marine port. 
um, on the assumption that there was nothing there. Right. They just described it as an unremarkable beach. Unremarkable beach was how Colin Barnett described the area. Um, wow. <laughs> you showed that. <laughs> and, and, well, and based on that comment and then um, some surveys that were done by the West Australian government that, that sort of confirmed that, um, knowing what was really there um, and fearing what would happen, um, the traditional custodians for that stretch of coast and the song cycle that passes through it, the Galara Baloo people contacted us to, to get us to come up and, and document the tracks and sort of you know demonstrate their scientific significance in, in the hope of of saving them from, from this development, which would have resulted in, in Womerton being destroyed. Um, so we started doing that in 2011 right. um, <clears throat> and we're able to get within about six months of starting, we were able to get the area uh, National Heritage listed. Oh, wow. Thankfully, the um, then Environment Minister, Tony Burke, was um, convinced that even though we hadn't done the science, the, the photographs and things that we were able to share with with him, it was enough for, for him to decide it was worth National Heritage listing. And that, that, was, a, that was a good development, but it, it didn't stop the WA government proceeding with their plans for development and, and you know we had to really fight it in the media and there was a there was a huge campaign hmm. um you know it wasn't just about the dinosaur tracks as um a very rare type of um coastal rainforest that occurs in that area um it's a whale carving ground there are all sorts of reasons why you know it seemed like a crazy idea to put this gas plant there and thankfully, in 2013, Woodside, who were the, the major um, developers for that project, decided to pull out. Um, so that was really good. And that took a lot of pressure off us doing the, the research. But, you know, we still wanted to finish the job and sort of show everyone, you know, why we had been so adamant about protecting this area. Yeah. I'm I'm just amazed to hear how close it came. It sounds like it was like very much, uh, you know, right by the skin of your teeth sort of thing to save this this area. And especially given the you know the traditional owners have got such a long history. I read some of the articles uh, that Ed sent me, which um, talked about how they um, they had you know obviously um, a lot of folklore and Dreamtime stories and so forth about the various tracks that they knew that. That were there, but do you know whether they were aware that there were actual, you know, like these tracks, these sauropod tracks, these incredible, incredible footprints that you found, uh, or was it more just the uh, the stories about you know very large emus and so forth? Um, well, the so for this part of Australia in, in the West Kimberley, um, one of the well, the dream time there is referred to as Bugaragar, and in the Bulgaragara there, one of the creation beings is, is called Morella. And Morella is the emu man and he was also the lawgiver. So he sort of instilled in country, you know, ways to behave and, and how to to act to ensure its well-being. So he's a fairly important person in, in, in the scheme of things up there. Um, and he left tracks along the coast. So these are the, the big three-toed classic sort of dinosaur tracks that everyone would sort of be familiar with and maybe recognise as a dinosaur track. Um, and obviously they look like oversized emu prints. Um, and I, I, I remember thinking, you know, uncovering and, and recognising all these other tracks which, you know, were not part of the, of the original story. So this would be in some way be seen, you know, be in conflict with the... <coughs> traditional beliefs is linked to the other dinosaur tracks there but what i found was really sort of surprising and, and relieving and it was it was really great to sort of go through it all was it was just seen as as country revealing more stories um you know they saw that as as, as that was you know part of what needed to be revealed at that time and it was just adding to its history so it wasn't in conflict at all um and Importantly, you know, for me, I'd be like saying, "Oh, that's a that's a theropod track, or this is a sauropod, or whatever." Um, it didn't matter what those animals would have looked like, according to us. It's more about their sort of presence and, and the spirits that inhabited them, and, and how that's continued through to today. Um, so, there was at no point was there any 
sort of um, <coughs> hesitation about sort of seeing it all as, as fitting in, um, which was really great. And it's, it's, and it's <coughs> been seen now as something that really um, strengthens that area and it's added to it. So that, that was really kind of cool to, to sort of see that and also, you know, just appreciate these tracks from a completely different perspective. That's because it's one of the few areas, if not the only area, where in the world where dinosaur tracks are part of a creation mythology. Yeah. You know, and that that was known as well. That was known as well when this <laughs> area was selected and it was ignored. I mean, the thing is, you got to remember, we were talking about forty-five billion dollar project. So this is bigger than the NBN, bigger than any government. <laughs> initiative that's been on the table for the last decade or so this is this was a huge project that had a massive amount of investment behind it and and it's physically huge too like it was going to extend three kilometers out into the ocean or something wasn't it or something ridiculous like that yeah so it had a an onshore precinct area so two two pipelines coming ashore the gas so the gas isn't even there the gas is about 400 kilometres offshore in the Browse Basin and it was just going to be piped into Womadon, um, two big pipelines, and then there was a, a huge big LNG plant um, and, a, and a harbour would need to be created for all the tankers to come in and the breakwater for that harbour probably would have been <laughs> made up of dinosaur tracks and the rocks that contain them and that would have extended out three kilometres. Um, so it would have completely changed and disrupted the movement of sand along the coast. Um, you know, would have, they would have destroyed that entire area um, and, and we sort of ended up focusing on, on, the, on the area that would have been affected by the footprint of the gas plant and that was, that's roughly 25 kilometres of coast. So everything that we've described in this paper, um, all these tracks and all this diversity and you know, this incredible window that we've got on ancient Australia, um, if things had gone differently, um, <laughs> we wouldn't be talking about yeah. it. Steve, terrible. can I just say, on behalf of Australia, thank you. On behalf of the world, yes. thank you. Because, yes. I mean, it's just, it is mind-blowing to think that that was going to be so easily swept aside as unimportant for so many reasons, it's just unbelievable. That I know. It's not like there's another one down the road no. or anything like that. Um, and, you know, the fact that it's even there after 130 million yeah. years um, yeah. is incredible. It, just, it was, it was mind-blowing to think that it was being considered, but it was. Mm. And even when, as we were, you know, revealing aspects of its, of its prehistory, um, that was just being swept aside, you know. Look, we'll, we'll, we just can't can't accept that. We're just going to have to go ahead with this development. It's too important. Yeah. But thankfully, it fell through. I think it was you know the a lot of the delays that we were able to to put in um, in place just through the campaign, various aspects of the campaign. It really prolonged um, how long it took them to try and really get anywhere with any of their pre-development stuff and then it just became financially no, long, no longer viable yeah. which you know resulted yeah. in them having to pull out i think economically unfeasible was their euphemism for too much effort too difficult to get past this so well done on that yeah anyway now now we're entering at least a, a new phase where we can sort of look at this area and hopefully you know l utilize it for things like ecotourism and stuff yeah. and it'll be much much more in line with, you know, what people think of when you think of the Kimberley. Um, so that's an exciting sort of phase to enter now. Especially, as you say, uh, your research was concentrated in a 25-kilometre sort of stretch of coastline. It's a very long coastline. <laughs> There's a lot more out there to be explored. Yeah, well, the, the, the rock extends all the way down to Broome and past Broome. And, and yeah, through it, there, there are more tracks. So there's... There is there are different sort of suite of tracks in the coast around Broome. Um, they're in a different sort of environment. The rocks sort of represent a different different phase of that of that area. Um, so it's all part of a, an amazing story. Mm. But the thing is, we we really notice when you get into the air and look at this place and and sort of pinpoint where the, where the track sites are. Um, they're very minuscule in the big scheme of things. There's there's a lot of coast. There's a lot of sand. 
there's lots of reef systems that are covered in corals and oysters and all sorts of things. And then every now and then there are little patches where there are tracks, but really they're they're only a small part of a big coastline. Mm. Um, it's very sort of scattered and stuff, and it's you know trying to piece it all together. Every little bit counts, which is why we were so adamant the whole area needed to be conserved in its entirety. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and so that's probably uh, research for in the future, uh, those other areas along the coast. But I want to go to another big story uh, that you broke, really. Uh, was, it, was it last year or a few years ago where you went on an expedition to Antarctica also looking for dinosaur footprints and fossils? When was that? Um, that was at the start of, of 2016. So just, just last year, this time last year, I was probably just coming back from Antarctica. Um, it was um, a, a trip that was, it was many years in the planning. There were 13 scientists involved, two of us from Australia, myself and a um, colleague at James Cook University, Eric Roberts. Um, the majority of people, though, were from the US and the funding was from the National Science Foundation and it was it was sort of run through the US Antarctic Program. Um, and we all sort of came together and, and decided to do this project to get into Antarctica because um, Antarctica during the Age of Dinosaurs was really like a bit of a keystone continent. It sat in the middle of all the Gondwanan land masses. So through most of the Age of Dinosaurs, um, Australia, Antarctica, South America, Africa, India and Madagascar were all joined into a great southern landmass called Gondwana. And um, if you want to try and understand, for instance, you know, where Australia's dinosaurs came from, the ones that we, you know, things we can piece together here from stuff in Victoria and Queensland um, and also these, these tracks and things in the Kimberley, um, the next place you want to look is in, Antarctica, because Australia was joined to it. That, that was the way in and out of Australia through the entire um, Mesozoic and even up until about 50, 40 to 50 million years ago. So um, <laughs> the obvious issue is that most of Antarctica is is frozen, <laughs> co- covered in ice. The, uh, yeah, there's only really two, two parts where you get to see the rock, and one of those is the Transantarctic Mountains and the dry valleys of, of sort of East Antarctica, which are it's probably the most remote, inhospitable place on the planet. Um, the other place is in the Antarctic Peninsula, where during the austral summer, um, a lot of the snow and ice melts and the rocks are exposed. And the rocks that are there, thankfully, come from the end of the Age of Dinosaurs and even into the start of the age of mammals they actually cross the from the cretaceous into the paleogene so we see the actual boundary layer where you know all the non-avian dinosaurs disappeared so it's a pretty cool place to go and you know <laughs> maybe search for answers yeah cool <laughs> um search for an- answers um for australia's dinosaurs and their origins and you know whether you know any of them um were part of groups that were also present in South America and also, you know, trying to unravel the origins of, say, our marsupials. Yeah. Um, which came in came in through South America into Antarctica, into Australia. That was the only way in and out of, of, of Australia. So for all those reasons, it's a good place to go. Um, and we can also test ideas about the extinction event and sort of see what happened because it's also one of the few places in the world where we have continuous deposition in a couple of areas across the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. So we actually see before and after the extinction event, you know, presumably caused by a massive asteroid impact in, in Mexico. Wow. And... Again, I've got to come back to that. How do you search for this stuff in a large area? I'm guessing a huge area. Is this just drones and helicopters and things? I mean, you've got to get to all that area first. And I know you had a lot of trouble even organizing this trip because of um, the the sea and the weather was a lot of difficulty. So is it aerial surveillance or is it just a big long hike? <sighs> Well, I mean, one of the things I like about paleontology is that, you know, we, we, there are instances where we do get to use cool technology, <laughs> but a lot, of, a lot of the time, 
you've got to do it the way it's been done for hundreds of years. You've got to walk around with a hammer and, and look at the ground and pick up rocks, crack rocks, lick rocks. <laughs> um, you just you just got to look. And, I mean, that, it felt a bit strange. You know, we had this huge research ship. We had two helicopters. We had, you know, a huge support team behind us and set up these massive camps, you know, took ages to get there and stuff. And then it was like, okay, go, guys. And <laughs> we just sort of wander off up into the hills and, you know, look around. I mean, there's, there's no other way to, to really do it. you got to sort of spot stuff. Um and, you know, finding it down there amongst all the snow and ice and rocks yeah. and things is is really hard. But there was enough. We, we did find enough to sort of keep you going. Enough? <laughs> you, you know, you've got more than a ton of fossil material and bones and stuff. That's pretty impressive. Well, there's a lot. So the area was um, part of a shallow sea. So most of what we would come, you know, the things that we would come across would be fossils of marine animals shallow marine thing or things that inhabited this little seaweed mm-hmm. seaway so there are lots of ammonites yep. and sort of coiled squids yep. and lots of clams and snails and things um lots of marine reptiles this seem to be a, a real haven for marine reptiles so lots of plesiosaurs you know, thing that people think the Loch Ness <laughs> monster might be um mosasaurs the killer of Indominus Rex in Jurassic World. Oh, yes. Um, so and marine marine lizards, lots of those. Um, and even early modern birds. So there's a type of, it belongs to the same lineage of ducks, a, a bird called Vagavis. Um, we find remains of those. The rarest things are dinosaurs. Well, obviously, dinosaurs don't live in the ocean. Um, they're on land so the only chance you've got is finding the remains of a dinosaur that has died washed out into this seaway and then somehow you know not being consumed by all these things that live in the ocean and had it had parts of its of its remains preserved and then you know if you get lucky you wander up the right hill and, and spot you know a toe bone sort of that's tumbled down in amongst all the boulders and things um so that that's that's the kind of you know there's no there's no good place to look other than everywhere <laughs> wow. yeah so we, we spent literally five weeks just wandering around trying to cover Every bit of ground over you know vast area because you <clears throat> can really only sort of when you're looking on the ground and you know trying to spot things the size of your fingernail sort of thing um, you can really only sort of scan a meter or so either side of yourself so you could walk in a line for a hundred meters and have missed something that was two or three meters away from you so we spent ages just sort of doing these monotonous transects of you know up and down and up and down and, and you know it's not always flat terrain either it's off it was off the antarctic peninsula is quite mountainous so you know be kind of going up and down these hills and crossing little glaciers and through crevasses and all sorts of stuff to sort of get to these little spots where you could sort of have a bit of a search um and we did find, we'd found a few little pieces of, of dinosaur, which was <laughs> heartening. Yeah. Um, but we still haven't figured out exactly what they were. They're, they're getting prepped at the moment in the, the Carnegie Museum um, over in Pittsburgh. Actually, where actually that's, which leads me to a, to a question I just want to ask. In terms of that massive haul that you brought back from Antarctica last year, how long does it take to get through? sort of that amount of material is that, are we talking about years of sorting and prepping and mounting and trying to match it all up like like puzzles or what you know what, what sort of time frames are involved in that yeah years <laughs> um, and it, we we only we only just got um the the shipment into pittsburgh about six months ago it took that long to get it up from from chile um, through customs in LA and then across the US and more checks and stuff. And that's all got to be unloaded. I mean, we catalogued a lot of stuff on the ship on the way back um, before we all got too sick from the rough seas. Um, so we did, we did catalog a lot of it, but mu- a lot of the stuff needs to be prepared. So, you know, it still had 
rocks and stuff and, and dirt and things attached to it. So we've got to clean all that off before we can actually see what we've got or, you know, make, make good sense of what we've got. So, um, so far we've, we had a, a really nice um, sort of pectoral girdle, like the chest region of a, of a big plesiosaur that we um, were able to get off the side of the hill in a jacket with a helicopter, which was kind of fun. <laughs> um, so we've opened that and um, that's been prepared. About half of that's been cleaned up. Um, and then we've been working on some of the bird remains we've got and the little dinosaur bits as well. And then a lot of the other sort of things that we collected, there was a lot of rock samples that we're using to try to get a better handle on the date of some of these units that um, fossils are carrying. Um, we, we collected lots of, of ammonites and things. We can use parts of those shells to get dating information we can also we also are interested in looking at the the temperature of the water so you know we, we talk about you know a thousand kilograms of fossils but um there's lots of boxes of rocks and samples of dirt and you know all sorts of things that um you know there's and there's a lot of us working on different parts of it um but, but we'll get there and it's exciting now to have a lot of stuff to to work on because it's it's just so hard to get down to that area oh. Um, so, you know, while we had an opportunity, we collected as much as we could. Yeah, because we might not get down there for another for another while. Yeah, yeah. In one of the articles that, that Ed had sent me, there was a, um, a recounting of, of your story of the, of the day that you found this, uh, this impressive uh, fossil on, the, uh, on, on this hilltop in Antarctica. And uh, it, it, it always just sounded just casual that, oh, you know, we weren't even sure we'd get up there and then the weather broke. So we managed to get a helicopter up there, which, which was great because it saved us from the hike. And then, yeah, we're only up there for a day and in the afternoon we found this massive... <laughs> it's <laughs> like, it sounds just so casual. Like it's just, yeah, yeah just another day in the office as, as a paleontologist, really. It kind of was. It was, a, it was a good office to be in there for the time we were there. Um, <laughs> But, you know, when you're in a place like that and, you know, you know what it takes for you to be there, you know, how long it's taken to organise it, the money, the support, all that sort of stuff. Like we we used every minute. That's all we did. You know, we, it was all about trying to do as much paleontology as we could. And, you know, it was, it was great having, you know, two helicopters pretty much at our disposal to help us get around and, and do a lot of things that we normally wouldn't have been able to do. Yeah, um, that, that did you take them a... with you or was that part of your expedition or they've already based in Antarctica? Well, found next to a plesiosaur. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, they, they, came, they came with us right. on our ship. Right. Um, I know this, this all sounds really crazy. It was amazing to have such incredible support from the National Science Foundation. Um, so they came with us and it meant that you know, we could get to a lot of areas that you normally couldn't. And we've even with the helicopters, there were times where it, it got tricky because, you know, our camps, you know, they, they got iced in a couple of times. So oh, wow. sea ice would block us in so we, we couldn't get out with, with Zodiacs. Yeah. Um, and then when, when the weather set in, then the, it got too cold for the helicopters. You know, they because they're all their rotor blades and things start to freeze oh, up. You know, on a helicopter freezing up mid-flight. So no, yeah, not no, a good there, was, there was there, <laughs> there was a, a period of about five days where we were kind of stranded, and it was like I hope this weather improves because it was it was only going to likely get worse. You know, because we were coming out of summer, heading into <laughs> the start of winter, um, and it was getting fairly blizzardy. You know, we could there was snow on the ground. We couldn't see see rocks and fossils anymore, and we were sort of stuck in our tent, hoping, you know, there was a break. And it was literally we had about six hours um, to break camp and get out of there. And that was that was kind of intense, and it was a relief to get back on the boat. Yeah, no, that that is just amazing. You must have gone through a lot of audio books and podcasts. I'm guessing while you're down there. <laughs> stuck in a tent for three days, played a, <laughs> played a lot of card. Ah, of course, and a lot of chocolates by the look of things from one of these photos oh, that you God. tweeted. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, the, the Americans on the team. Their idea of lunch was, you know, two Snickers bar and a Cliff bar or something. It was, <laughs> it was hard. Um, <laughs> How did you not yeah, come tough back? Tough life. Morbidly obese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> well, I made sure I took down my own stash of miso soup and, and had other things because I didn't want to try and survive in Antarctica on Snickers no. bar alone. Was, <laughs> some people did <laughs> somehow. Yeah. I, I, did, I also noted you uh, in one of the photos there, you have a rather epic beard. I assume you, you, uh, you, you grew that in advance. That's not a five-week beard. No, and, and then I just let it go <laughs> while I was down there. You know, it didn't matter. Yeah, it was kind of sort of good and bad. and kept you warm. But then on some days when the when the snow really kicked in, your beard would freeze because freeze, of yeah. all the moisture around your mouth and you just end up with this big frozen beard sickle. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I know. I, I put it down to, to just all part of the Antarctic experience. Yeah. I don't think oh, I'll ever have a beard sickle again. So. <laughs> It, it's a fantastic opportunity and experience that you've had. I mean, not many people get to say that they've gone on a trek, gone hiking in Antarctica. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, no, it was it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Uh, just a more sort of a general question. Um, I'm noticing in a lot of these, uh, the photos that we've seen on a number of articles and that, uh, there seems to be a fairly good sort of a gender diversity split amongst the teams uh, that you've been working with in Antarctica in particular. Uh, is that a common thing in paleontology? Is there a good ratio of male to females or is it the boys' club still? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I did a thing on BBC the other day where I was on the TV and as soon as I appeared, the the guy at the other end said, oh, you look like a classic dinosaur paleontologist with your beard and stuff. And I kind of Ouch. thought yeah, it was funny at first, but then, you know, when I think about it, half of the, half the paleontologists I know definitely don't have a beard. Um, and would never be able to grow one. So maybe maybe the public's perception of, of sort of the gender bias in, in sciences in general needs to change because definitely in paleontology there are a lot of, of good female paleontologists out there. I mean, we had um, in our Antarctic team, it was, it was pretty evenly spread um, in terms of, you know, the, the number of guys and girls on the team. Mm. You know, we, we it wasn't really something that – any of us discuss because we're just mm. sort of used to it. You don't really, that's that's not a thing that comes up. Mm. Um, Fair enough. So, yeah, I think, <laughs> I think other, other people have got to get get around um, the issue that, you know, a lot of these sciences have, have got lots of, of good women in them, mm. um, you know. That's just, I mean, that's that's really encouraging to hear because this, there are, Still, some 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 areas of science that we we come across in our you know throughout the show and the people we speak with, where it's still a, a big issue that that gender balance and and gaining access, particularly to the more senior sort of levels in in either academia or research or whatever. So uh, that's that's really good to hear. That's very encouraging. Yeah, well, I, I know the institution that I'm at is is very accommodating with regard to you know people having kids and being being really flexible about it. It's great. It's great for for women to get into that system. I think because you know they're they're looked after. And what's uh, the best way for people to get into paleontology? And in is it just a straight up paleontology course at university, or do, do people come from various other industries and things as well? Um. There's not many places where you can go and do a degree in paleontology. It's sort of, it's a bit of a lot of different sciences. It's predominantly geology, mm -hmm. um, but also biology. Um, so, like for instance, myself, I ended up, I did like a double major in in zoology and geology um, because you know you've got to you got to know your animals. Um, you've got to be able to piece them together from often fairly fragmentary remains. And then you've also got to know you've got to know your rocks. You've got to know how to find things. You've got to know how to put stuff into, into, into context. Yeah. Um, you, you need a good handle on ecology, um, particularly if, you, if you're doing sort of paleoecology and trying to you know, piece ancient habitats and animals and things to, together in them. Um, you know, a lot of people come into it with a, with some chemistry, get into the sort of geochemical side of things, um, looking at fossilization and stuff. So it's kind of sort of it requires a good grounding in a, in a lot of different areas, and then it's up to you how you want to sort of specialize. Oh. Like you know, if you want to get it really really get into things like you know biomechanics and understanding how animals moved and stuff, then you're probably going <clears> to <throat> go more towards the biological side of it, and maybe have a bit of physics in there as well. Um, but if you wanted to get into you know looking at the distribution of various 
types of animals in the past around the world, then you, you probably do um, more of the, the geological subjects where you look at um, landmass distributions and timings of, and ages of things. So, you know, sort of I think anyone who does a, a, a good, well-rounded science degree um, and has maintained an interest in, you know, whatever area they really want to get into, then you'd be well-placed to get into paleontology as a postgraduate student because you really need to, you know, you have to do honours and ideally a PhD to get properly into paleontological research. So it's a long road um, to get somewhere and to be able to do it professionally, um, but it's an enjoyable one if you can get there. I mean, I'm having a lot of fun doing the (laughs) stuff I'm doing right now. It certainly sounds it, and uh, you're doing some fantastic work as well. So I, I really enjoy, you know, <clears throat> um, sharing what we do, and if it's a way to <clears throat> inspire people to get into science or just sort of inspire them to, you know, get into the adventure of, you know, searching for unknown things in far-flung lands, and, you know, that's good because it's, it's good to dream and it's good to, to wonder about the world we live in. And I think paleontology is a, a really good science for that and a lot of people get into science um almost by accident just because of their interest in in things like paleontology yeah very very good note to end on dr steve salisbury thank you so much for joining us on science on top no worries i enjoyed it it was good <laughs>